conservative commentator Glenn Beck's show was pulled from Apple Podcasts on Wednesday, which, according to him, was done with no prior warning or explanation. But now Apple is saying it was just a trademark issue after restoring the episodes. Hmm. Well, in a video posted on X, formerly Twitter, Beck said Apple simply cited that they found an issue in his program and that it had to be resolved before it could be available. He slammed that decision. Let's watch. This is absolutely uh, freedom of speech. There's nothing that we have said that would warrant any removal. Um, again, it's probably just a glitch, but it's amazing how we have to have a whole bunch of people point out the glitch before the glitch is found and it's put back. Um, man, this is, uh, this is huge. Um, we, well, I'm getting ready to do the show for, or, or rehearse the show for tonight. Uh, tonight's a really important, maybe that's what it is. Is they, are they just, maybe they're just smoked because, uh, you know, I'm pointing out the real crime family tonight on Blaze TV. This is why it's so important to get Blaze TV, because um, we're not playing this game. We don't censor. We don't censor anybody. And out of all the shows, my show is the one to get nailed. As we noted, Apple does appear to have reinstated the Glenn Beck show. As of this morning, the entire program is available once again with latest episodes titled "Trump versus Biden," which is the real crime family. So. I saw a lot of um, of outrage on social media about this, saying this is you know another example of big tech censorship. I think J.D. Vance, Josh Hawley, weighing in in that way. Um, look, there are a lot of censorship decisions being made on platforms that I don't agree with. Some of them even done at government behest. Um, Apple says this was a trademark issue, mm -hmm. and I, I just scanned through like the recent episodes, and I don't know, this is my theory, but I would bet you it's because of this clip. Let's play it. Mm. We've known each other a long time. I can't remember the last time you invited me out for So he's doing a Don Corleone impression. I like Glenn Beck. I don't think this is the greatest Don Corleone <laughs> impression I've ever heard. I love the little cat. The little cat edition is fantastic. Um, that music in the background you're hearing, yeah. I bet that was uh, the, the copyright violation. And you know, for, for those watching at home, this is an issue that every that all content creators deal with on platforms uh, for for images and for music in particular. Like sometimes we want to play footage of stuff, video stuff, but we can't play it because it's unclear who has the right. This is actually a field of you know, copyright that is, it's, it's not clearly been adjudicated so obviously. Like there's a lot of stuff I think c counts as fair use that we can use, but it's like why take the risk? Mm -hmm. um, because the person who owns the right to that sound or image might sue you over it. And even if you're ultimately right and a court would say, yeah, you get to use it, it's fair use, you don't want to go through that litigation. You, you'd have, you actually have to pay people to like pay off people to stop complaining about it. Um, this is an issue a lot of publications run into. You know, if you, we have a parent company, they don't want to deal with that. Uh, I mean, they've got armies of sure. lawyers, but they, we do training on exactly what kind of sound we use. You still screw it up every now and then. My bet is it's that. Just so, my guess. You know, that seems very plausible to me, especially in a world where, you know, Joe Rogan has the most successful podcasts in America and was offered millions of dollars to have an exclusive deal with Spotify. I haven't seen a lot of evidence that a disinterest in a certain kind of content is driving decisions as opposed to just popularity and the ability of these corporations to make money off of folks, including Apple making money off of someone who's very popular like Glenn Beck. So I am inclined to think that, yes, this was a copyright issue. But my question to you is, do you, are you concerned at all whether it diminishes legitimate speech issues um, for someone like Glenn Beck to perhaps exploit the glitch here and reframe it as a, quote, huge free speech issues and, of course, why you need to subscribe to a show and pay him more money, mm -hmm. when there are other significant free speech violations going on, for example, I know that Reason recently covered the story of the Kansas newspaper that had, like, the entire local police department um, search it, take, take computers, documents. Um, literally like commandeer an entire newsroom um, with the arm of the state. 
You know, are you concerned at all about the way that free speech obviously has this purchase in a certain segment of the population? You know, understandably so, it is a really important issue, but that it does seem to get exploited in instances that aren't necessarily what I would call to be the biggest free speech issues of the day, or even perhaps well, free spe speech issues at all? I mean, I can understand people being a little, um, for, for, I can understand content creators be having a knee-jerk um, reaction to being yanked off platforms. I've, I've reacted that way when my content has been taken down on by YouTube and by Facebook, which has happened a couple times. You know, I've I've gone full Karen. I've gone. I need to speak to the manager. Why did you do this? And uh, and I thought it was BS and argued that it was the case. And with the case with Facebook, it got reversed very quickly. Um, the YouTube case, infamously, we you know fought that one tooth and nail, but we they wouldn't reverse it. Um, is it no? Is it as consequential as what you described, which was that was the actual government coming in? I think to the this newspaper headquarters and taking stuff, and I think the the, the lady, the editor, actually died as a result of mm. the stress. Um, of course, that's that's more weighty, sure. But you know, people can be um, outraged about multiple things. If, if you're saying that people who are so mad about online censorship don't you know talk about the more garden variety censorship of the, the, the government actually directly arresting people for speech and they should do that more. That's fair enough, but, you know. I mean, also, there has been I mean, also, I would trend. also say that mainstream liberals who ostensibly are support the First Amendment and don't like censorship should, you know, be, be a little bit more, um, I don't know if this is still the case. There was an era of just patly dismissing all of the claims that Conservatives, contrarians, leftists, et cetera, had about shadow banning and, and maybe what's going on online. And there was just like a pat dismissal of that from liberals um, that was not, I think, useful. Sure, but I, I, th I think the trend that I'm identifying is not just kind of rhetorically on the internet, but substantively at the Supreme Court level, the First Amendment has been expanded in its application to preclude what have historically been considered to be democratic rights and privileges. So I think the most significant example is in Citizens United, where speech is the justification for undermining what we previously believed to be limits on unfettered spending that were supposed to be protective of democracy, which is a principle the Founding Fathers spoke directly to, right? The idea of one man, one boat needing to be protected by not allowing there to be this aggregation of extreme wealth that could be used to subvert our democratic political processes. It was part of why the original corporation was time limited, I think, to 20 years. So the government says, oh, we understand that there are instances where you're going to need to raise large amounts of money to build roads and bridges and infrastructure and things that the government isn't necessarily going to do in every instance as this new country is growing and expanding. But we're concerned about being able to grow large pots of money outside of the government in this way. So we're going to term limit how long the corporate, your, your corporate license is going to actually last. And so they, they understood this. They considered this. And now we're in a situation where I think conservatives have really understood that they can effectively pursue policy like getting rid of campaign finance regulations by wrapping these as up as speech issues. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about whether or not we're gonna hit a wall where either there was a kind of boy who cried wolf feeling about people who talk about free speech because of instances like this Glenn Beck instance potentially, assuming of course that it is about the copyright and not genuinely targeting him for his beliefs. Or alternatively, if you're gonna get court cases that characterize everything as a speech issue to such an extent that people stop caring you know, and what is that going to do to legitimate speech issues like um, advocating for the freedom of Julian Assange if you've basically neutered people from having an instinct to want to say, yes, this is an important issue because it seems like so many people have been weaponizing it in bad faith? Um, there was a lot there. <laughs> I mean— well, we're going to the founders. Their view of you know the First Amendment was just that it applies to Congress, right? They they, they were not. It's, yes, they, I don't know that they would have necessarily envisioned. I mean, they wouldn't have even envisioned a lot of these um, protections for anything expanded to state issues or other. Like they literally only thought this was going to apply. This was going to constrain the federal government and Congress's behavior. I mean, they wouldn't have conceived of all the various agencies, government agencies we have at every level, state, local, and federal. The, you know, so we're we're trying to 
retrofit what they wrote to apply to a lot of situations they wouldn't have necessarily envisioned. Yeah, but I they, certainly agree that they, that's not the best way to go about designing our well, society, but I'm trying but, to play by Republicans' rules, who very much try to root their um, I mean, I know how you feel about the about Citizens United and the campaign finance agenda. I mean, this is not, this was not just a, like a fringe right-wing view that money should be speaking. I know, well, it's a mainstream a, right-wing view. Well, it's, it was the ACLU's view as well at the time. Right. Um, <laughs> the, 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 that's that's a, not entire, entirely accurate. There were specific facts of the case that were were, were what they were. Right. But they the, were trying to prevent someone from releasing a documentary about Hillary right. Clinton. Right. But the question about whether or not the broad public actually wants there to be unlimited spending in the way that Citizens United allowed is not one that's up for debate. Most people are very much frustrated with the fact that there is according to that Princeton study in 2014 that I'm always referencing, not a democracy anymore because the thing that is directing what Congress chooses to do is corporate spending, lobbyist money, and not at all the will of the people that ostensibly are participating in this democracy. So I'm just, I'm just raising it as I think that is, I'm watching this trend and I'm curious about where it's going to go. And I wonder if there is going to be any pushback at a certain point because Arguably, we're getting to a point where if everything is a free speech issue, if, if Donald Trump doing fraud, document fraud and trying to pressure people to change election results and all of that is being characterized as free speech, is it eventually going to lose its potency? And is that kind of a bad thing? Because there are real free speech issues afoot that we should be focused on. Well, sure. But we just some, we disagree about what those are, right? A lot of people of my persuasion think the being able to spend um, your money for political advocacy is also a form of speech and should be protected, just like the right of the newspaper people who had their you know door banged down by police and their stuff confiscated or whatever else happened in that case. Just like um, you know when the right, when Apple takes you takes down your podcast, that's not a free speech issue if they did it because. Um, I mean, I, I guess to the extent copyright is a free speech issue, I actually think copyright is probably way too zealously guarded and actually is kind of a free speech issue and the category should be slightly done away with. But uh, but uh, now if, if the government encourages or makes Apple take down your podcast, then maybe it's a First Amendment issue. So these are things that are going to be um, adjudicated over time, I yeah, guess. Indeed. More rising right after this. <laughs> 